Okay, it's David Ostriker here on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. There's so much to talk about Rosh Hashanah, and so many people will speak, speak about it. Uh, the nature of Rosh Hashanah is to recognize who our king is, Malchios. A chauffeur is a memory of all things past and things, and a memory of things in the future yet to come. It's an opportunity for us to examine our behavior and to improve it, to improve our relations with our fellow man, to correct errors in behavior. It's a seed for the year to come, why we have apples with honey, for instance, so that we should be fruitful and have a sweet year. These are customs and ideas that revolve around setting a path for the new year. You know, in Rosh Hashanah, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. Hopefully through the year, and then through the month of Elul, and now during the time of Slichos, we have a great deal of time for self-examination and improvement. We have a great deal of time to make peace with those with whom we've struggled during the year. Also with God, and in so doing with ourselves. So I want to wish you and bless you all with a thoughtful year, with the year of resolving issues that need to be resolved, helping others, um, and benefiting from the process of health and of nachas from those you love and love you. I want to take a moment to talk about something that not so many will speak of. This Rosh Hashanah comes early, early in September. And a hundred years ago, on the 5th of September, in 1918, there was a very significant event. Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, made a public statement of endorsing the Balfour Declaration. Now, this may seem like a history lesson, but it is actually a lesson for the future as well as so much of Jewish past is. It was the end of the First World War. The Brits had been tasked with uh, taking over parts of the Ottoman Empire that included Palestine. And the decision had been made by the British cabinet that Palestine would be a homeland for the Jewish people. And it was endorsed through what later became known as the Balfour Declaration, named after the cabinet member Balfour, um, to guarantee a home for the Jewish people. Well, we look around us today and we see that home for the Jewish people, and wow, it is something else, right? I'm sitting here in Carmiel in the Galilee, the home of the wine country of Israel, of beautiful greenery, and of a powerful, confident state of Israel, a home for Jews, and a home for those Jews who need a home. 1930s will never be repeated again. Never. In the 1930s, there was no price to attack a Jew. Today there is. The Iranians in Syria have found this out on a nightly basis. Those who would attack us need to know they will pay a very, very high price. We live securely in our land and we thank God for it. But it wasn't so a hundred years ago on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Not at all. And those who fought against the state of Israel, Zionism, it may surprise you to know that it wasn't limited to anti-Semites. And it wasn't limited to the fringe element of Nortre Carta that 
bizarrely sides with Palestinians and Iranians against Jews having sovereignty in their own land. It was a very significant portion of the Jewish population. Sadly, of the reform movement and the Orthodox movement for different reasons. The reform movement had come to believe that the Jews did not need a land, that they were the witnesses to God in this world in whatever land they were in, and consequently making a piece of property, the home of the Jewish people, would actually diminish the role, diminish the role of Jews in the world. It turned out to be a patently false philosophical position. We see it in retrospect, and we see the very, very, very high price that was paid in Jewish blood. Um, that came from not having a home. So it seems like that issue is settled. Alas, I fear it is not. There is dramatic division once again between Jews in Israel, Jews who support Israel, Jews who are Zionists, and many, many Jews especially politically, sadly, to the left, which used to be a home base for Zionism, that see Israel as an embarrassment. They see it as a right-wing exclusive club. I asked them to come and visit here and see the variety of Jews, you know, the idea of two Jews, three opinions is really an understatement, I have to tell you. It is a vibrant, free, dynamic, exciting world filled with Jews from all over the world and many, many non-Jews, Christians, Arabs, Muslims from all over the world living and thriving. And so recently, there was another uh, dramatic moment in the nation state law that made Hebrew the national language of Israel. Arabic having a very special place, but not the national language. Um, Russian, <laughs> from my experience at Carmiel, seems to be a very big language here. English, I don't know. It's. Uh, it's a language that works in some parts of Israel, in many not. Hebrew was reborn here as a living tongue, and it thrives. The role of Israel as a Jewish nation is tremendously important, and consequently embedding it in the laws of Israel is not a casual thing, but a foundational element. And yet, many of our, there's some here, but many, many people, Jews in North America, consider it to have been a very bad move, to have been a kind of racist move, hostile to non-Jews. It isn't. Minority rights are protected here, unlike anywhere else in the neighborhood. Uh, so, this Rosh Hashanah, we are reliving the divisions that were evident Rosh Hashanah 1918. I hope dearly that we resolve them with less acrimony and more um, positivity. So, in closing, uh, I want to wish you all the Chasim Simatova, a Shana Tova Umetuka, a good and a sweet year. Uh, be well, and I will speak, be speaking to you um, 
before Yom Kippur for sure. Shana Tova.